Then Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves because tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify. I don't know about for you, but for me, that word, both printed and when spoken, seems so stilted and so pure. One almost fears touching it so as not to smudge it with fingerprints. Sanctus, 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 holy, holy, holy. Imagine an angel chorus raising this refrain. It's almost as if you can feel the weight of sound just in this one word, sanctify. It's close to scary. Yet not scary enough to deter determined or foolhardy theologians over the ages. From examining what that word means or how it works. Now, in the interest of fast forwarding through the gobbledygook of academic jargon, uh, I will summarize the uh, meaning of the word sanctification as spiritual growth in pursuit of holiness. And over this process of spiritual growth, God is in complete control. Yet, at the same time, God, as demonstrated in our theme verse for this morning, calls us to smudge our fingers all over the process of sanctification as we prepare ourselves to experience the wonders that God has in store for us. Instead of as a form of stilted purity, sanctification in this sense seems more like a call to adventure. Hold on to your hats, watch out, or fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy ride. If Joshua's command to ancient Israel to sanctify yourselves lends itself to a modern analogy of God as our co-pilot, if you will, in our spiritual growth, then what are we to make of the role of this morning's plenary theme, grace, in our own sanctification? If we're to smudge our fingerprints all over the sanctification process, and if grace has any role to play, and if we consider the commonly held definition of grace as God's unmerited favor extended to creation, then wouldn't Joshua have just been better off telling the people, sit back and let God sanctify you instead? Well, one aspect of all this involves the notion, again reflected in our theme verse, that we can do so much. Our capacity is immense, so much so that we often spend time avoiding it, running away from it, or denying it. Consider the case some 5,000 years ago of a 90-year-old woman, Sarah, who laughed at the notion of giving birth about one year before she bore a son, Isaac. Or consider Moses, a Hebrew stutterer raised in the court of Egypt that found the words and the strength to stir his people to flee Egyptian oppression, to walk across the waters, to occupy a land of milk and honey. There are times when we cannot run away from our capacity and when we can't help but to live into it. Consider 
the case of a lost boy, a child refugee from Sudan, traveling thousands of miles on foot to seek the shelter and the safe haven of a relief tent, subsisting on leaves and an occasional stem along the way. When faced with tremendous obstacles, we can and we do overcome. Now, another aspect of this, perhaps even more important than the first notion, is this. We can only do so much. Though great, our capacity is limited. Do you remember the story uh, in the book of Numbers of Balaam? and his donkey, she sees the angel of the Lord as it blocks them on their path. She balks, and he rebukes her harshly, not once, not twice, but three times. And even though God gives this donkey human words, to warn Balaam, she could not, in his stubbornness, prevent him from appearing before none other than the angel of the Lord to be the bigger ass. <laughs> it's only after the angel of the Lord opens his eyes that he is finally able to see. Or Looking back at the account of Joshua, we look at the final chapter, the book of Joshua. We see Joshua's final words to the Israelites, admonishing them to observe the covenant, which he could do. What he couldn't do was prevent latter generations from ignoring God's covenant, from forgetting their promises to God. And he couldn't prevent them from avoiding exile and destruction. Or, if we look in the New Testament, consider Martha, if you will. Martha could sweep the floor she could draw jugs of water from the cistern, bake the bread, pour the wine, pickle the fish. And she could play parlor songs on the harp. But what she couldn't do was curry more favor from Jesus than her sister Mary. And Mary simply sat in the presence of Jesus. She sat with him and kept him company. We all have our areas of weakness that stunt our capacity for growth. And it's when we recognize our weaknesses, when we recognize that our so much is never, ever enough, then we are able to appreciate fully the role of grace in our sanctification. When our efforts bump up against our limits, then we can freely free the grace of God at work in promoting our spiritual formation. It's through our limits, as Tracy said earlier, that we come to know God more fully by allowing grace to enter in. And it's through our prayers and our meditations and our Bible studies, our songs, our gatherings, and our service of loving kindness and acts of giving to one another 
that we prepare spaces within ourselves to receive the gifts of grace that help us to become more and more holy, to be formed into the people that God calls for us to be. See, the wonder of grace in our sanctification is that God gives the growth and that God births the breakthroughs. And on this morning, as we celebrate together and as we grow in grace, may wonders never cease.